What's up everyone? It's DSP here. Uh, just hanging out today. Uh, and this is my first edition of DSP's Inbox. Um, if you were paying attention a couple weeks ago in one of my channel updates, I actually gave out a new email address, dspinbox at hotmail.com, where I said from time to time I would actually be reading those emails and answering some of them in a video series. And uh, this is part one. So without further ado, let's get into it. DSP's Inbox. So here we go. Uh, just for the record, I got over 500 emails uh, within the two and a half week period since the uh, address was open. By the way, if you send me more than one email, like some people send me like five to ten emails, Hotmail does tell me it's the same person, you know, and so obviously I'm not going to read all of your emails. Also, I can't promise that I'm going to read every email, but I did skim through them today. I did pick out some of the ones that I was uh, most interested or intrigued by, and uh, so here goes. Our first email is from Zombie246, and he says the following. Hey Phil, just wanted to tell you that Bioware said on their website a month ago that there will be a Mass Effect movie coming out. What's your opinion on that? Uh, well, I think first of all, any time that a video game is good enough to be recognized to be worthy of having a movie made of it, that's a good thing. Um, however, unfortunately, as we've seen with the track record for video game movies, they've been pretty shitty. Um, and so with a game like Mass Effect, where even Mass Effect 1, the campaign was something like 30 hours long if you went ahead and did all the dialogue options and things like that, you got to kind of wonder how they're going to cram something like that into a two-hour movie. Now, don't get me wrong, I think that they could probably take a lot of the elements out of a game like Mass Effect and make a pretty cruel, kick-ass, you know, maybe two to three hour sci-fi movie out of it. I just don't see how they could take the real story from Mass Effect and try to cram it into such a short period of time. So, I'm stoked that they're doing it uh, to answer the question. However, I guess we're going to have to see as more details develop, you know, what the movie really looks like, if they're going along with the game plot or a totally new plot. But, it's pretty cool. Um, our next uh, email is from Baby Notox. And uh, <clears throat> it reads as follows. Me and my friends really wanted to go to the SBO qualifiers at Game Galaxy Arcade to enter the Super Street Fighter uh, 2 Turbo Tournament. I was reading the info, and the game will be played on the USA version of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo Arcade Cabinet. Me and my friends mainly play HD Remix. This is uh, a pretty good question. Up until last week, it was fine. But then at a Super Street Fighter 4 tournament here in California, one of my friends told me that the games are completely different in speed and character changes. I knew it wasn't a straight port, but is it really a completely different game? Excellent question. Um, and coming from being that I am a, a, a pro Super Turbo player, that is the game that I'm known for playing, you asked the right person. Uh, the bottom line is absolutely yes, 100%. There are speed changes and there are gameplay changes to Super Street Fighter 2 HD Remix, which is available right now on Xbox 360 and PSN um, as a downloadable title. Uh, basically what happened was one of uh, the former pro players, David Serlin, actually worked for this company that developed HD Remix, and what he was really looking to do was to perfect Super Turbo and, and basically re-release it for the masses with new art, remixed music, and also tweaked gameplay. Um, but what ended up happening was it kind of split the Street Fighter community. There's pretty much half of us who really are dedicated to Super Turbo, the original version on Arcade. We just love that version and we wish there could be an Arcade Perfect port. And then on the other side of the fence, there's a bunch of people who have adopted HD Remix and said, this is a pretty good game, we're going to play it, and uh, it's, it's in a lot of tournaments now. It was an evolution this year. It's been at previous tournaments uh, uh, all throughout the country. Uh, personally, my personal opinion of it is that it's okay. I think that Super Turbo is Super Turbo. It's a, a really well-balanced game. Not to say that there aren't tiers, but as I said in previous videos, if you really play your heart out and you practice, you can win with any character in Super Turbo. HD Remix, what Serlin, David Serlin tried to do was try to balance a lot of the things that he felt were imperfect with the game. However, a lot of the changes he made are just really odd, some that people never asked for, like actually making characters like Blanca take even more damage, which makes no sense because he's one of the lowest uh, tier characters in the game. Just some really bizarre choices in design and things that he did with his changes that really make some people get upset about the game. Personally, I'll play it. I mean, if people want to play HD Remix, I'll play it, but however, since Super Battle Opera was coming up, and I knew the qualifier was coming up, I've purposely not played HD Remix this entire year so far. I didn't want to play that game and have maybe some small, subtle changes throw off my, my uh, game for the Super Battle Opera qualifier. So, 
that's why you haven't seen me going around playing HD Remix yet. And, you know, I've really been, I've abstained from it. I told myself I refuse to play it. I don't want to throw my game off for regular Super Turbo. So your question is very valid, uh, Baby No Talks. If you guys only play HD Remix and then you came out to try to enter the Super Battle Opera qualifiers, you might have found some changes in there that might have thrown off your game. And they're not going to be massive changes, but they might be enough that you would lose a match because something happens that you didn't understand. Um, so, it is what it is. I mean, HD Remix, at least there is still a version of Super Turbo that's being played in tournaments competitively. I'll leave it at that. Uh, our next question comes from Ishikabi. And he says, hey man, I was wondering if you had the time to tell me what tournaments and dates do you remember winning or placing near the top? I tried to Google your tournament appearances, but I couldn't find a list. Um, great question. I would say stay away from Google simply because historically, Street Fighter tournament results don't end up on Google. Uh, but if you check out YouTube and you search for DSP Dark Side Phil, uh, you know, Super Turbo, you might find some older footage from like Evolution uh, East 2006 and 2007. I actually won Evo East 2006 and 2007. And first they had Anniversary Edition and then they had a PS2 version of Super Turbo that was on uh, Capcom Classics Collection 2. I won both of those events. Uh, my highest placing ever at a national level was actually at Evolution 2005. I placed fourth place in the Super Turbo tournament that year. That year it was actually the Super Turbo version that was on the PlayStation 1. Um, I was actually the highest ranking U.S. player that year. All top three spots for Super Turbo that year were Japanese players who had come over to participate in EVO. So technically that year I was considered the national champion. Of course there was all kinds of controversy around that because people were saying, oh, who is DSP? You think that he's good? He played on a PS1 version of the game that has slight differences. It's the same argument between Arcade Super Turbo and HD Remix that I just talked about. There's going to be differences in every port of the game. And a lot of the older players, the older school players, didn't appreciate the fact that I played so high. They thought that it might have been a fluke because it was just the console version of the game. However, I think I pretty much proved myself when in 2006 and 2007, not only did I take EVO East both years, but in 2007 I actually went to every single EVO qualifier in the country and I placed... Uh, top 8 in every single one except for the Midwest Championships which was actually played on American controls on an arcade cabinet. I cannot play on American controls. I suck. I openly admit I need to play on a Japanese style joystick to be good at, at, at Street Fighter. So, Pretty much I shut everyone up that year and no one's really challenged me since then. But the bottom line is I haven't been to tournaments since 2007 anyway really. So you know, there's really no, no one really getting in my face about it. Um, our next question comes from the Dark Knight Matty T. And he asks, hey Phil, during your 2010 mid-year game schedule review, you said you're going to record Soul, um, Soul, I almost said Soul Calibur 2, StarCraft 2, and I was wondering how you were going to do that. Good question, simple answer. As you've seen in some of my videos, I now have an Alienware laptop. I bought a really long HDMI cable that goes to my receiver, which then goes to my HDTV. So basically I'm able to play HD, you know, uh, uh, PC games on my system and I'm just going to record just like I always do. Uh, I just actually tested it tonight, played about 10 levels of Portal, it looks great. So I am really psyched, I'm pumped for playing StarCraft 2 and hopefully there will be games worthy on the PC of being played later in the future, you know, PC exclusive games and I'll, I'll try out some of those as well. A um, couple more questions, I'll try to get through them quickly. The next question is basically from uh, JB Hig Higson, his question is do your donations from fans ever cover the cost of all the games and the equipment that you use? Um, and the answer is no. Um, I do get donations, but a lot of people are really over-exaggerate what they think I'm getting. I've never bragged or said that I'm making so much money, because honestly I'm not. And even if I did, I wouldn't be like that. But I don't make a lot of money doing this. I mean, it's cool that people do send me donations, and I appreciate it. Please, you know, again, if you ever do feel like donating, you can. Just do uh, darksidephil at hotmail.com through PayPal. That's how I accept my donations. Um, however, it, it really doesn't cover the cost. When you take a look at just the games I've played this year, the equipment, the new camera that I'm using right now, the other cam camera that I bought, the Canon, um, I go through constantly new equipment, new things, the money to travel to places, for example, the money to travel now to Tennessee to enter the Super Battle Opera qualifiers, and if I win to go to Japan, that kind of stuff is all on my, out of my pocket. Nothing's paying for that. Um, but don't get me wrong, the donations help. I appreciate them. They definitely do help if there's a tight time and someone wants me to play a new game and I get a donation. It's awesome. It always helps me out. And you guys really did help me out a couple weeks back when my uh, Xbox Live account got hacked. 
by sending me those uh, donations, you basically put the money right back in my account, and I didn't have to worry about uh, basically having any bills being overdrawn or anything like that because that asshole stolen money out of my bank account. So thank you very much. Always appreciate the donations, and uh, you know, by by all means, if you can afford it and you really willingly want to do it, go right ahead. But I would never, you know, try to solicit anything from anyone. Soldiers15 at Hotmail.com says, are you willing to get, are you, not are you willing, but are you getting the new Xbox 360 Slim? I've already addressed this in my E3 review. My answer is absolutely not. I have no reason to buy a 360 Slim. First of all, anyone who uses wireless internet, just so you know, if you use it for games online, it's awful. It creates lag. It can make your connection uh, disconnect. It can cause lag in your inputs, especially for fighting games. You would never want to use a wireless connection ever. Um, for other games, it's a little bit more forgiving, but if you really want the best experience, you have to have a direct connection. So I don't care about the built-in wireless. I already have a hard drive that's more than big enough for what I use. I have no need for a 250 gig, and there's nothing else about the system that's appealing to me. They say no red ring, well, big deal. I have an Elite right there that I've had for over two years with no red ring, so big deal, right? No, I'm not buying a Slim. There's no reason to get one. And in my opinion, if you already own a 360, there's really no reason to get one. It was a really dumb marketing ploy by Microsoft, and there's no reason for anyone to buy one. Three more questions. The next one it says something about owning my soul. Oh wait a minute. Trade your the subject of the email is sell your soul. So I'm excited already because let me tell you I've been waiting my whole life for Satan to come in and make me an offer that to sell him sell him my soul. I don't give a shit. Give me fucking wealth and fame and a hundred beautiful babes who all are on my cock all day. I'm ready. So hopefully this is it. This is my chance. Sell your soul to Demon Souls on PS3. You should consider playing it. Fuck you, Tetsujin29. Fuck you. Wasting my fucking time. Anyway, up next, uh, XFlash XSD says, This is not a hate mail, but I have an honest question. Do you go out at all? Do you have a girlfriend? How do you manage your time? Yada, yada, yada. And... This is a common question. People ask me this all the time. It's hilarious to me because people actually think that, like, if you like video games and it's your hobby, that, like, you couldn't possibly have a life outside of that. How could you have friends and a girlfriend? And how could you manage all your time if you play video games? I mean, it's just such a stupid notion, really. Like, the, the culture of the United States has just made people who enjoy certain things feel like shit. I, I mean, I feel bad for people who maybe grow up liking video games and they get made fun of or whatever. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's part of our culture. Video games are now making more money than motion pictures. Think about that. The movie industry wishes they could make as much money as a video game industry. So, it's serious business now. It's not time to, to get rid of these stupid preconceptions and, and notions that anyone who plays video games is a loser who has no fucking life. So to answer your specific question, do you go out at all? Absolutely I go out. I just went out last Friday and I saw Inception and I did a review about it when I got home. I go out all the time with my friends and we don't just always play games, we go and do other stuff. There's all kinds of things in the world to do besides video games. It just happens to be my main hobby and the thing that I enjoy doing the most. And I share it with everyone and everyone, you know, makes out because of it. Do you have a girlfriend? Well, oh my god, I love when I get this question. Oh. How could he possibly have a girlfriend? No girl would touch a gamer. Get the fuck out of here, man. I've had girlfriends in the past. I have girlfriends, you know, in the present. Do I currently have a steady girlfriend right now? No, but that's my choice. There's not. It's not that there's no options out there for me or, or offers. I just don't really want to have a steady girlfriend right now. I'm working on some stuff at work. I'm trying to get this YouTube thing to work. Um, and I really don't think I could even deal with a steady girlfriend right now. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not girls who I like, who I see every once in a while, if you know what I mean. That's just, you know, that's life. I mean, the, if you don't believe it and you think that I'm making it up, you're out of your fucking mind and uh, you're basically just a jealous idiot. You're jealous that you can't have a life where you can have fun playing video games, but also be normal and have women and have fun. You can do everything. You just need to have a balance. And actually, that's as great question is this third part of his question how do you manage your time very carefully I make sure that when I do things like the, my YouTube channels that doesn't overlap with other critical important things in my life for example I work an 8 to 10 hour a day job and I make sure that I'm not running the fuck out of there to go home to record a game I make sure that I'm not staying up till 5 in the morning and then trying to go to work at 7 I ration my time so that I have enough time to do what I want 
and if you're a mature adult, anyone should be able to do that. And it's the same thing with money and everything else. If you're a rational adult, you can be able to plan and say, I have a budget and I can afford this and this and this. And you don't overspend and you don't rack up your credit cards. And to be honest, when I started this whole thing on YouTube, you know, it was a little bit tough because I wanted to play every game. But I had to put my foot down and say, you know what, I can't play every game. I don't have the money to do it. I don't have the time to do it. So I pick and choose the games that I like the best. And in my free time, I do playthroughs of them. And I have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. And I have a life outside of that, and that's that. That's the end of the question. I hope that was a sufficient answer for everyone who was either hating and trying to basically be like, ah, oh, there's no way you could possibly have a real life and do what you do. And I hope for people who are inspired and want to do something like this and enjoy watching my videos and are worried that maybe it would hinder their lives, there's a way to do it and to have a balance. That's all it is. The key to this, the answer to the question is a balance between everything. So it is what it is. My final question for this first uh, session of DSP Inbox. Hey Phil, why did you decide to start doing game playthroughs and what, who inspired you to do so? Well, and that's from JediFan421 by the way. So thank you everyone. First batch of questions were very good and interesting. Um, to answer that question, it's a funny story. Uh, basically, what happened was, I had, was playing the game Lost Odyssey on Xbox 360 and I didn't want to buy the strategy guide because I'm sorry. You shouldn't have to go buy a 25 fucking dollar strategy guide to figure something out. And in most cases, I would say games, if you're at a tough spot, you don't have to cheat. And to be honest, there's very few games that I ever look anything up for anymore. The exception would have been like Secret of Monkey Island 2. I had to because a game like that, there's no real hints or clues that tell you what to do. Once you get stuck, you're fucking stuck because of some of the silly stuff that happens in the game, the silly combinations of objects that actually solve the puzzles, you probably never figure it out unless you sat there clicking for 30 hours straight. And who wants to see me do a 30-hour playthrough for a game that's only five hours long? It wouldn't have been efficient. Um, but I remember in particular when I was playing Lost Odyssey that there was this one part of the game that I was just stuck. I couldn't get by it. And it, I think it was that I didn't know what to do. I don't think it was a certain boss or anything like that. I just think I was stuck and I didn't know where to go, what I was looking for. The game wasn't being very clear. And so I went online and I noticed I couldn't find any videos of this game either. I was like, what's going on? Where, where? And then finally on YouTube, one guy, I mean only one guy, had a playthrough of this game on YouTube. And he didn't do any commentary or anything. It was just straight gameplay. And so I had to kind of skim through all his videos trying to find this particular part. And finally, after searching for like an hour, I found the right part. I found what I was supposed to do. And I said, shit, man. You know, strategy guides are for the past. The wave of the future is live playthroughs, live walkthroughs. Uh, and I wish that, you know, there could be value added. Because in order to really be successful in life... You can't just do one thing. You have to do it and then have a value added to it. So when I play games on YouTube, I don't just want to play the games. I want to also give live commentary, jokes, things like that, my live reactions, because that adds a value to that product. It makes it unique, and it makes it marketable for everyone who wants to see it. Everyone wants to see my videos because of that unique factor that I add to them. Um, and so I was realized at that point, you know, keep in mind this was around, I think it was around early 2000. I want to say, it brought early 2008 when Lost Odyssey was a new game. I don't remember exactly when it was released, but um, at that point in the fall 2007 was when I found out about my back injury. And for those that don't know, I have a severely herniated disc in my lower back. Um, it's never going to get better. It never does get better, that kind of injury. You can either deal with it and adjust your lifestyle to it, or you can get surgery that may or may not work. It's very expensive and would mean that I would have to take a lot of time off of work to recover. So the time being, I opted to try to live with the injury, and I have been for about three years now. And I have to say, I had to make some changes in my life, some things that are kind of upsetting to me, but at the same time, I've learned to cope with it. Um, and actually, it's one of the main reasons why I started playing games so much is because I realized I couldn't go out and play a game of football anymore, and I couldn't go, you know, do a strenuous physical activity, but I could still stay home and enjoy video games, which was one of my hobbies. So... After the whole Lost Odyssey fiasco, um, I believe it was the fall of uh, 2008, and I was bored, and I've been playing a lot of games, more games than usual, uh, since, like I said, my back injury had was bugging me, and I remember playing this game, um, I think it was, dead, it was either Dead Space, Saints Row 2, or 
I can't even remember. Mercenaries? I think Dead Space was one of my first videos. I swear it was one of my first videos. I remember playing this game saying, damn, this game is, is scary as hell. But a lot of my friends really aren't talking about it. I wish there was a way for me to get the word out about this game. And so if you look on YouTube, one of my earliest videos is called Dead Space Chapter 2, Scary as Hell. And the purpose of that video wasn't to be a walkthrough or a playthrough. I just wanted to show gameplay of Dead Space and show everyone how good it was, how, how scary I thought it was. And after I kept playing, after I started seeing comments, people were like, Wow, Phil, this is a good video. Keep going. We like your commentary with it. And so I actually played through a lot of the game. And after that, I said, you know what? People seem to like when I'm giving my live commentary and my live reactions to the games. Why not do more? And so I started doing other games. And the rest is pretty much history. Uh, I think, really, I started to become popular on YouTube when I did Spider-Man Web of Shadows later that year. I believe it was October of that year. For whatever reason, I mean, this is crazy, that game is still one of, if not the most viewed game that I've ever done. And I think it was because no one could find a better quality playthrough of that game on YouTube with commentary. Like, there were, I guess there were videos of it, but nothing interesting. People liked it when I was playing, giving my reactions, oh, this is hard, oh, this is fun. It was just something that they had never really seen before, and, uh... After I saw how popular some of those videos game, I think one of them almost has 500,000 views, I said, shit, I can really maybe do something with this. And at that time, I had the shitty camera, wasn't even widescreen, I had to go from the side angle at the TV, you know, it looked really bad. But after a while, after I kept doing it, and especially after Street Fighter 4 came out, being that I was a, 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 a pro player in Street Fighter, and I knew a lot more than anyone else who was playing the game and making videos, People really started to value my, my, my commentary and my insights into these games, and the rest is history. You know, I upgraded my camera, started playing a lot more games, uh, opened up the, the donations line, obviously, um, eventually got a partner channel, The King of Hate HD, where I don't put any game-related footage or anything like this. You see videos like this instead, and, uh, you know, I get some ad revenue off of that, which is very nice uh, to have a little bit of extra money in pocket for expenses for things like this, and, uh... For the most part, it's worked out pretty well. Uh, so I'm going to keep doing it until, you know, there's a reason for me not to do it. And at right now, there really is none. So I enjoy doing it. I hope you guys enjoy it. That's really how it started. There's no big, you know, amazing story behind it. It just kind of happened due to circumstances in my life and things that were going on. So that's it. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this first part of the DSP Inbox. Uh, feel free to send me more emails. Again, it's dspinbox at hotmail.com. Remember that uh, this week, later on this week, I will be at Super Battle Opera Qualifiers in Nashville, Tennessee. So if you have questions about that, feel free to send me any questions. Um, I will be taking video there as well. And as long as the Internet's fine, I'm going to try to upload it you know, while I'm there. If not, I'll have to wait till I get home. But um, that's it. So thanks for, uh, for caring. Thanks for sending me questions. And uh, I'll see you next time on DSP's Inbox.